Welcome to the celebration of the life of Robert W. Andrews, Reverend Andrews. As those of you who might not know me, uh, my name is Philip Panowski. I served on the board of the Phoenix community in Delaware for 10 years, along with several other people who are present here. Uh, I would just like to thank, right at the beginning, uh, the New Ark United Church of Christ for being such a uh, such wonderful host to us here, allowing us to, to have this event here and using all their, their beautiful facilities here without cost. Right so again, uh, thank you, thank you so much. And before we begin, uh, go much further, we're going to have an introductory prayer by a good friend of Robert Andrews, the Reverend Canon uh, Philip Wheaton. So, um, Reverend Wheaton, would you please come and, and get us started? Feeling of weakness or uh, 
whatever, and uh, accepted that. And uh, we had a uh, really nice uh, time with him before and after that those public meetings. And then we returned to the States just recently when we heard that he had died. It was a great shock. And has created a great sadness and emptiness on all of our hearts, I'm sure. Bob's goal in his long sojourn in Costa Rica was to enlighten people about the reality of our government, which repeatedly lies to us or distorts the reality of the dark side of our nation's reality, which is its imperialist side. We are a marvelous democracy. We are an all-powerful empire. Something that most Americans don't like to face up to. And it was this task that drove him and guided his life's work. Another such American hero is a man by the name of M. Scott Peck, M.D., who sought to uncover the truth in his book, The Road Less Traveled By which includes the word grace, as in the poem by John Newton called Amazing Grace. I would like to end my introductory remarks by reminding you of that poem. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious, precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come, tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. And when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first began. Amen. Amen, Father. <clears throat> Mike Billy, please, who's going to sing for us uh, today, had heart surgery. Uh, that was God. his heart. And he was thinking of uh, getting on his, <coughs> his car, driving to Pittsburgh, and uh, then he changed his mind quite wisely to understand. Uh, he wanted to sing a song. And so uh, I'm going to play it for you. We can listen to it, but let me make a few preparatory remarks. Uh, at 16 minutes to midnight on July 15th, 1999, Pedro Martinez, a Mexican, seeking work in Newark, was asleep in the back seat of an 88 Mercury Cooper. When the driver approaching the Deer Park on the West Main missed the U-turn at the old at the old Wonderland. And as soon as he saw it was heading the wrong way, he attempted to turn left on 896, but was stopped by a Newark police officer who held him right on top of the CSX railroad tracks. In spite of warnings from patrons and Deer Park employees that there was a midnight train on its way, police officers Michael Van Kampen and Blake Pataki were busy assessing the threat and refused to allow the driver to move the car until they heard the whistle of its approach. And uh, though the driver of Pataki attempted to start and then push the car off the tracks, it was too late. And the car was slammed by the train and Pedro Martinez was killed. Note that it is illegal to publish the names of police officers involved according to the Police Officers Bill of Rights, but the News Journal published them anyway. That's what happened. Bob Andrews, Andrews organized several public and private meetings on the issue and helped force the state legislature and federal attorney to investigate. 
On the other side, the well-connected the Delaware's tiny family of privilege released their whitewashes, and so as we have foreseen repeatedly in the whole Black Lives Matter affairs, impunity prevailed. Still, Martina Cisuelo in Mexico was awarded an undisclosed assault. One of the witnesses, seeing that the account of the cops being warned about the train were being swept down the memory hall, left town. According to Mike Billingsley, such resistance by Bob to miscarriages of justice that benefit the well-connected is not unprecedented. He was also in the re involved in the reaction to the 1960 murder of Hattie Carroll, an African-American barmaid and mother of 10 in Baltimore by the rich young tobacco planter William Zenzinger. Zenzinger got six months. Mike Billingsby was going to sing the lonesome death of Hattie Carroll to us, but as I said, he had a medical event. So let us pause for a medical, a musical interlude by Bob Dylan on Hattie's death and contemplate the power of privilege and our responsible ability to be like Bob and, and speak out, damn the consequences. Mike Billingsley's tribute to Bob Andrews is sitting in uh, out there on the table along with the other tributes, along with the uh, resolution from the uh, state of uh, Delaware, uh, put together by um, uh, Harris McDowell and, and Catherine Fulger, so uh, people that uh, Bob worked with very closely for many years, especially the late, uh, I forgot his first name, remember? But, um, Bill. 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 Thank you. Huh? Bill. Bill. Like Bill. Here. Phil. Bill. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, on your program, as uh, Father uh, Wheaton referred, uh, there's a quotation from the Bible uh, that uh, Bob Andrews uh, said to me at least once. Uh, although, probably. Uh, you know, so there's a, there's a danger that something like that could be misunderstood, especially since it's only recently that you know Bob, as it were, has sat before the seat of judgment and wondering whether he was hot enough for you know the Lord to absorb him in, or whether he was spit out. You wonder what am I saying about Bob here? But really, right now I'm sure Bob is up there on the left side of the seat of glory, uh, really cursing me right now for uh, using the tepid, uh, lukewarm, uh, uh, revised standard version, uh, whereas the King James Version doesn't say that the Lord will spit you out. Uh, he says he will spew you out. And there are versions that say he will vomit you out. And so, I'm uh, sorry, Bob, but uh, very few of us are up to your level of confrontation. Um, you know, it really has to do with this insistence on saying what is true, and, and subject to deliberate misunder misunderstanding, yeah, or the overblown taking of, of taking of offense, rather than cowering in lukewarm language, as I've done here. Uh, that's why if you ever express an offense, offense, taking offense at something that Bob said, he would be sure to repeat it. Um, I mean, this is part of the reason he said in the ministry he established the Phoenix community in Delaware it was the community in Delaware, not of Delaware. Uh, we were not in Delaware, uh, of Delaware that we represented Delaware, but we were separate. We would uh, preach, so to speak, as Ann, Andy Young put it, uh, with our bags packed. Of course, Bob was also known for being a soft touch, taking all manner of lost souls and sheltering them at the Phoenix House, or from the streets of Brazil and sheltering them at Ticadel. One of my first encounters with Bob was around 1965, when I was out with uh, one of the residents for a night of carousing. I had to carry my friend back with him back home because, because he was roaring the room. As I was trying to guide him with considerable difficulty back to his room without waking the house, Reverend Andrews came in the door accompanied uh, by a number of dignitaries. Hi, Bob! He yelled out my friend before I could force him through the bedroom door and dump him on the bed. 
Later, when I spoke to Bob about it, I was sure both my friend and I were on his get rid of list for embarrassing him. But he was not embarrassed at all. His only was concern was what effect the incident would have on my friend's self-esteem. Remember Jack Edward? Bob's hospitality could drive others to distraction. In a 1974 letter of resignation of a Phoenix House facilities manager, that I found in the use in the United Campus Ministry archives, I read the following report, somewhat abridged. From time to time, all lost or stranded travelers would be referred to the Phoenix for overnight lodging. We didn't know why people thought we had accommodations, but once people arrived, it was, it was difficult to refuse them. About eight or 10 people or groups of people each year stayed in the Phoenix. This list included an engineer bicycling from Colorado, young people roaming, uh, a, 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 a juvenile who was kicked out of his home, home home, a runaway juvenile who never stayed but rather was convinced to go home and return, and two individuals who later, later became uh, residents. Since the students were willing for their part to take the risk, it seemed rather inconceivable for the church not to accept a similar risk in the name of Christian love. I might add, he says, there were occasional thefts that resulted from this. But back in 2010, I was teaching a course in the 60s. One of my students interviewed Bob, and I think what she reported is an excellent summary of Bob's theology. According to Ann Bruce, she writes, the Christian faith, quote, required us to be in solidarity with the oppressed. It was clear at the University of Delaware that, that there, was a, there was a shocking kind of oppression against African Americans and certain liberals. Jesus Christ himself represented commitment to help the oppressed find justice. He stood up publicly for these principles, encouraging others. This inspired Andrews to encourage students to rethink the status quo. It was his Christian obligation to devote himself to the side of the subjugated. A, some doctor from the University of Delaware even stated that to be truly religious is not to expect to be loved. Meaning, helping others and not expecting a reward in return. Within his values, when people would ask Reverend if he was a religious man, he would respond, hell no! I'm trying to take Jesus Christ seriously. <laughs> Showing that he did not believe in religious practices in a separation between groups of people. He believed that religion, any kind of religion, should have the fundamental goal of helping those in need of the simple necessities and liberties of life. Quoting Barth, a German professor in the, of the early 1900s who opposed Hitler, people with faith should be politically involved, quote, having a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. The tendency of our society, she continues, is to divide, paraphrasing Bob, is to divide what is spiritual and real life, that Andrews wanted to bring religion into the public streets. There's a copy of her paper out there in Wells Hall, along with the other tributes, and none of the other. Now we all know that among the causes Bob was most passionate about was the cause of the Palestinian people. Back in the 60s, Bob led American Christians for Palestine and twice met with Palestine Liberation Organization leader Yasser Arafat. Over the years, Reverend Andrews brought to Delaware both Jewish and Palestinian speakers advocating self-determination for the Palestinian people in opposition to Israel's apartheid policy. These include the late Dr. Alfred Lilienthal, uh, our Ramsey Safuri, Hussein Ibish, then of the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, ADC, Rebecca Subar from Philadelphia Jewish Voice for Peace, Najin Yatim and George Zar from ADC, and Eric Elhana, the Israeli founder of Combatants for Peace. These Jews, Muslims, Christians, and secularists helped break open the one-sided discourse, dominated for decades by an imperialist U.S. foreign policy, opportunistic politicians, and the Israel lobby. Today, Israeli policies are often challenged in universities, public media, mainline churches, 
and even with hints and nuances by the U.S. Congress and the White House. National organizations like a Jewish Voice for Peace, Students for Justice in Palestine, Churches for Middle East Peace, and local groups like Del NATO, Delaware Neighbors Against the Occupation, have boldly widened the debate, first breached by visionaries like Bob Andrews. Now don't worry, you can still suffer the consequences, damned or not, reserved for the just when you get involved in this issue. You can still be misunderstood by those who don't and by those who won't understand. But if you know that the disposition of the Palestinian people cries out for justice, be like Bob. And for Christ's sake, speak out. Lest you be spat out like the lukewarm or spewed out. Who want nothing but warm fuzzies from their spiritual life. Churches for Middle East Peace and Del Nato are here today to carry on Bob Andrews' work, get to know their leaders, get on their mailing list, go to their meetings, and grow the movement. So, before we open the floor for your memories and testimonies about Reverend Robert W. Andrews, I'll offer one final honor to God's vision, a poem from a work I discussed with him before his passing. Now, the premise of this work is of a young man who is, uh, his mother was an indigenous Ecuadorian, and his father was a Lebanese Ecuadorian, third or fourth generation. Um, she was his maid, he was a hotel owner. Uh, he dreams of coming to the United States. To make a long story short, he succeeds. He gets here, gets deported to Lebanon, where he's never been, uh, gets to know this young man, Hamoudi, a Palestinian that he met who was, who was being deported from France, he met on the flight from Paris, Charles de Gaulle to, uh, to Beirut. And, uh, and at this point in this poem, and eventually he, he ends up in Guantanamo Bay. This is a poem, this is a poem where he and Hamoudi have gone to, to the ruins of Baalbek, so it's entitled the Roman ruins of Baalbek in Beka Valley, lately of Lebanon, Mandate France, and Syria. Chakobo, I know his name. Chakobo drags a stick through dry Beka earth. A scent stirs homesickness. Bread, ash, tostadas of wheat, corn, clapped against the heated stone. Past the billboards of slingshotting youth and posters of Hezbollah martyrs each hovering in a heaven of poppies and jutting from utility poles like giant postage stamps. And where the valley begins to sprawl are kiosks, unshuttering for tourists, and a town-wide campus of cylinders, blocks, and lintels stacked in sacred proportions or cracked and scattered. Like colossal dice, observes Hamoudi. Hakobo. Exiled Ecuadorian and Hamoudi, likewise Palestinian, have come to the ruins of Baalbek. This was all Canaan, Hamoudi instructs, where the first men ate wild, wild rye, then farmed as Jebusites, our ancestors. A cobble fixes his eyes on another genealogy and quotes from the brochure the temple of Jupiter Baal and Bacchus, and Firuz interjects, uh, interjects Hamoudi. The Lebanese Chanteuse, who sings here with empire ghosts, Assyrian, Byzantine, Crusader, Zionist. We Palestinians endure or don't, like a river. We give them a few decades or centuries at most to raise their temples and roll their dice. Call us Philistines, Maccabees, or Fidayim. Here are battle cries in Phoenician. Um, in, sorry. In Phoenician, Hebrew, or Arab. Our curses, pagan, Jew, monophysite, or Muslim. We inherit the seed of succeeding invaders that disembark, go native, or just go. Never changing the scent of Lebanon in a fire to Rome. So, let's an open up to you. Let's find out what you have to say. I know many of you came here anticipating the opportunity to tell your stories. 
Come in up here and use the microphone. I'll bring it down just a little because most of you are not quite as tall as I am. So please, uh, we look forward to hearing your words. Please introduce yourself in case we can't read that far to your, uh, your name tag. Anyone? Oh, thanks. Way to go, Marine. I'm Maureen Ben Tucker. I uh, remember Bob as uh, from Phoenix, but I also, and also as a speaker at the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Newark that I attend. Um, but I really got to know him because I used to go with Richard Rosenfeld, who lived a few doors up from him. And um, Bob uh, lived on New London Road at the time, and uh, he always had foreign students staying at his house. And um, he, he expanded my horizons tremendously. I really considered Bob to be a local hero who was so international in scope. And um, at the Phoenix, he would host people, of course, who had different points of view than our government was providing to us about any number of topics and issues. And um, also, uh, within his home, he would have various dinners and parties and uh, they were always very international in flavor with people from all over the world and dishes from all over the world. I had been raised in a Scotch-Irish house where pepper was an exotic spice. <laughs> Bob Andrews really expanded my culinary horizons greatly. Um, and uh, I also remember taking French lessons at his house with uh, Monsieur Isaac Mapp, who some of you may have, uh, may have known. He was a, a teacher at Christiana High School that I attended. And he was just a wonderful man also. Anyway, um, I uh, just wanted to um, recognize Reverend Andrews. I think he was just a wonderful person. And if there's any hymn that I associate with him, it would be Once to Every Man and Nation. And uh, I think the lyrics to that hymn really uh, are <coughs> part of who he was. I am pretty tall. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out this evening to uh, have some remembrances of our great friend and uh, courageous uh, hero of this area and for people all over the planet. And my name is John Cartier. Um, I wish Phil could put that picture back up of Bob. Um, I met Bob in the early 1980s when I was an under, undergraduate student at the University of Delaware. And I'm, I'm struggling to remember how um, I actually fell into his orbit. And uh, I do remember uh, the call sort of going through the door of the uh, Phoenix community building there at that time was the United Campus Ministry. And uh, seeing this person, we're going to see. Uh, this is a great uh, image of Bob because I mean, it, it really captures uh, some of the innate qualities very well. If you have a look, uh, there is a sort of uh, playful, mirthful look on his face. I'm sort of he's sort of delighted, uh, and then you notice the uh, large uh, brooch uh, around his neck. Uh, I don't know if you call it a brooch, but that is actually the, the phoenix bird. And Bob always associated himself with the phoenix, which was apparently an ancient Christian symbol. And that symbol uh, for him was compelling because the fires consume the bird, and the bird resurrects itself again and again and again. So that's why you see that, the mutton chops. I mean, that's uh, just, just outlandish. Uh, <laughs> and he was very tall. And I ran into this person, and we really looked like this when I first met him. Uh, so many years ago, and uh, I got to tell you, uh, this man uh, had magnetism, 
He, he lived an ethical life. Uh, you know, we're in an era where we talk about <laughs> social media and connectedness, and, uh, and I can just tell you that uh, before that era of social media, he, he kind of like lived uh, this giant social, ma social media life with all, all the technology. Uh, I can remember sitting in his uh, living room and he had a Rolodex, several Rolodexes, uh, and sitting there in phone call after phone call all over the planet of different people that he was in touch with about various issues. So when you fell in as a student into Bob's orbit and you kind of, you know, got involved, uh, you were in for a wild ride. And it was a very exciting ride. And uh, I can tell you that, uh, you know, being raised with, you know, kind of, kind of bread and butter, Roman Catholic, uh, Irish Catholic household, uh, you know, I had no respect for clergy, pretty much. Uh, and then when I married into this man, I really understood that, in fact, clergy people could be very, very serious. They could challenge you intellectually. They could mas you know, be masterful, uh, could really critique social reality, you know, be absolutely courageous. And I, I saw many occasions where, where Bob uh, was that and embodied that. And one of the, one of the, the problems of dealing with Bob in this, in this uh, brief time is that he, he led a, a life with so many chapters in it. I only know some. I'm sure other people know many more prior. I have met him in the 1980s, the early 1980s. He had a whole uh, social activist uh, resume that went, you know, years before that. So uh, in this brief time, I just want to kind of give you a flavor of, from that period in the early 1980s. And people are probably wondering, well, why did Bob end up in Costa Rica? What was so special about that? Well, I can tell you, I know how that happened. I was part of this group. We went down uh, after the, uh, the San Diego Revolution. Of course, Bob was very interested. He became very compelled by the, the liberation theology movement. Uh, we had many, many speakers come to the uh, UCM at that time, and, uh, espousing you know, the liberation theology perspective, very compelling speakers. In fact, one of the champions of that movement married my wife and I, and that's another thing I want to say, Bob Kahn celebrated the Mass and the service for my wife and I were married. Uh, so we were married by three clergy people. We're really married, let me tell you. <laughs> so, uh, when, he was, when he went on this trip, we went both to Nicaragua and Costa Rica, and it was sort of like a comparative national uh, frameworks kind of study, looking at revolutionary Nicaragua and Costa Rica. And I know that Bob fell in love with Costa Rica on that trip. Absolutely fell in love with the place. And what he saw in that country, first of all, it's the only country on planet Earth that by the Constitution has outlawed having a standing army. It's the only country, I, I still to this day think that's true. Uh, so he found that very compelling in the fact that in Costa Rica they've done a lot with education, They've done a lot of health care, uh, but it was a socially very kind of progressive country that we had had a uh, history of that. So uh, he, uh, and the climate, of course, is perfect. So, uh, you know, he fell in love with the place and, and so had a whole uh, life of kind of, he was kind of like this uh, snowbird. He'd be in Delaware, and then when it was a bad winter, he'd be in Costa Rica, and that went on for many years. And he had an extensive network of people there being developed over the years and finally permanently locating uh, to Costa Rica and continued until his final days, you know, doing the very activities he'd done his whole life. Uh, and I, I, uh, I feel very, uh, at this point, very uh, kind of uh, empty in a sense that he didn't leave us a memoir. He should have, he should have committed his life into writing because there are so many things that happened that he did and people he was in contact with. One of the, I'll tell you just a couple of more things. One of the uh, moments he told me about, because uh, he traveled uh, all over the large urban areas of the United States. You know, he, he, was, when he was in Chicago. He grew up in Chicago. He was in Atlanta. He, he fell in love with New York. So he was very familiar with large urban America. And he, he told me one story when he was uh, leading a group of students uh, up into New York City. And at this time, 
Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was still alive. Okay, the former first lady of, of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was a great progressive in her day too, and uh, had done tremendous work with civil rights uh, as one of her causes. And he told me a story. He said, we were on a street corner, John, the students and I. It was an early evening. And Eleanor Roosevelt had arrived at this location, and she was being let out of the taxi by uh, the driver and being escorted to the curb. And he said, in those days, you know, African-American people were lot, lots of more taxi drivers. And she, he, she, he said to me that all these taxis suddenly stopped and jumped out. The drivers jumped out to go shake her hand. And he said he witnessed the popularity of Eleanor Roosevelt at that time. So that's one of the stories. He had all these, these kind of encounters throughout his life. Uh, going back to his personal courage and, and uh, willingness to uh, stand up going forward to the 80s. In this trip, we, uh, we were in the American Embassy in Nicaragua, and it, it was at this moment that the Reagan administration decided they were going to go to war against these Sandinista revolutions. So what they did is they embargoed the economy, and then they began funding the Contras. That was in the New York Times. And of course, Bob read the New York Times, there was this the paper in one hand, the Bible in the other. Well, that was absolutely the case with Bob. And that New York Times, he studied it religiously and read it every day and would throw it in your lap and say, read this, the only serious paper to read, read that paper. You know, uh, he was a real fan of letters and, and constantly studied, uh, you know, read thoroughly both books, papers. But uh, I can remember the encounter with our group, Bob, with the, uh, one of the uh, undersecretaries in the embassy in this withering confrontation with this poor lady uh, over the Contra money that was being expended to destroy the Sandinista revolution. And she claiming that there is no such program. He said, Madam, I have read the New York Times and it's in the New York Times this morning. And she just reacting to that. So. He knew more than uh, a lot of the functionaries and was very studied. And, uh, so over the years, uh, he had a uh, huge impact on my life. Uh, I would say in my university life uh, and afterwards, uh, people were talking about how Bob broadened your perspectives and horizons. He certainly did that for me. Uh, he was a, a real individual, an iconoclast. They don't make people like this every day. Uh, and we're, we are impoverished in his passing. And uh, I think that uh, every, there's not many days you go by that I don't think about Bob and those days and what I learned. And uh, in my public service now, I serve on Newcastle County Council. I, you know, I derive tremendous amounts of inspiration from this man and what he represented. And, uh, in our own little way, you know, in my own little way, I try to uh, take care of the least of us and try to reflect those values that he left of me. And, uh, but this is a great picture. That, that is the man that I wish to always remember. And uh, he, uh, he lived with vitality uh, and tremendous, uh, Judy Brown, enjoy, enjoyment of life. He had a great sense of humor. Sarcasm was a, a science <laughs> with Bob. And I'll leave it, I'll leave it as, as a phrase. Uh, we're talking about Phoenix community in Delaware, not of Delaware. Well, the other phrase is darkest Delaware. Right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, and that's the social criticism of Delaware. So, uh, I'm going to close my remarks and uh, thank you for coming out and remember our our great friend, um, a person who lived an inspired and true life. Thank you. I wouldn't have missed this for anything, even though I feel like sometimes I have one foot in the grave and another on a banana peel. <laughs> uh, I want to first thank Philip and everyone else who arranged this service. 
and also for the obituary with Bob Pitts. If I have folks 89, every day I walk in my office, home office, trying to help make a little difference, like he made a great difference. Uh, I have on my three, walk, on three walls in my office photographs of my family, some not with us anymore, and friends, some not with us anymore. The last one I put up was Bob the Big Bird, which is Pittsburgh. <coughs> what I call my wall of love. I met Bob, my memory tells me, when the, the late Dr. Billy Ross of the University of Delaware's doctoral program for educational leadership asked me to teach the quality district model to his upstate and downstate doctoral students. <clears throat> That's how I met Bob. He asked me when we got to know each other, to join, to become a member of his board of his campus ministry. And then later, when he retired and founded the uh, Phoenix community in Delaware, I became a member of that. And all of these organizational experiences and personal interactions were just uplifting and inspiration. What impressed me so much about him was his moral character check of compass indicator was not just pointing toward what was right and just, not only in this community or state, but in the whole world, national, international. But he didn't just seek and acquire best knowledge for what was right and just. He put on, like my old University of Georgia Bulldog cleats, and he hit on every issue with passion. And that's rare, to be able to consistently speak out and try to inform and enlist people. So for that, I thank you so much. He helped make me a better human being. And I feel like I see many people in this audience who have pursued the same goals and objectives that Bob did. So I just simply want to say thank you for adding to the quality of my life and so many others. And I'm sure that his passing will not be any stop sign, but will help open up, especially for the young people he had to have influenced at the University of Delaware, will open up even different lanes toward finally achieving or moving closer to what is simply right and just for all human beings. <laughs> that you are neither cold nor hot, that you are li lukewarm. Well, he wasn't. He was either hot, keeping his cool, or he was cold, keeping his heat. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Dean Lomas. By the way, Dean is my, I'm a permanent Dean. I don't have that title my name, <laughs> even though at the university. And I was, I'm a native of Gary, Indiana, which is a, would have been a suburb of Chicago if it weren't for the state line separating the two states. The reason I bring this up because Bob and I are only two years apart. And when I met him in late 69, uh, we began to talk about our youth and we find out being from Chicago, <clears throat> we both had attended many of the White Sox and the White and the Chicago Cubs games. So the probability is that we were probably in the same park sometimes in our youth at the same time. What I want to tell you is something that happened in either in late 71 or early 72. I cannot remember it. Was it. Does anybody here remember the symposium or conference we had at Wolf Hall, either in late 71 or either spring of 72, on the Irish problem? Anybody here? No, okay, never mind. <laughs> we had two students. It happened to be one of them was from Northern Ireland, and the other one was from Ireland. And soon enough, they clashed. 
I didn't know what to do with them. I was fairly new myself. I'd come in 69. Their mothers were coming over in this, I guess it was in the spring of 72, whatever. Their mothers were coming over, so I came up with an idea. <clears throat> I went about. I said, I cannot have a conference or a symposium or whatever, and me being the, uh, the middle person, being on both sides. How about you as a theologian take over? He loved it. <laughs> so we got Wolf Hall, and we had quite a, quite a crowd. And we put the two boys up there, and they went at it for a while, and he was really, well, you know how Bob is, he can, and he can pull back, but he was keeping his cool. And then at the right time, without the mothers knowing that one, the two mothers were there, neither one knew the other one was there, we called them both on the stage. And then Bob took over on both of them. And he kept them up there for about 20 minutes, going back and forth, positive and negative, until both of them began to cry. And when they cried, they came across the stage in front of them, where they were sitting on the table, and they loved each other, and they, they felt the closeness that they should have had. Now I bring this up because had our foreign policy makers used that kind of a tactic, maybe we would have less nonsense in the world that we have today. I hope I've given something about his life. Thank you. I think John covered about what is up everything else. Uh, I don't have much to say, but I just want to say that uh, I met Bob. I met Bob in 1971 in June in in Thailand, uh, a province about 50 miles west of Bangkok. Uh, out of all places, we met on the bus. He believed it was raining. And I was sitting on the front, he was sitting in the back. And uh, out of curiosity, I looked back. I said, man, I said to myself, this man looks so enigma. I had to, I had to, uh, I had to talk uh, to him. So I did, and I explained to him you know, what I would like to do. I would like to uh, go to see the West, you know, to go to school, so on and so forth. And it makes story short. And he said, he said to me before he left, he said, okay, let's see what I can do for you. So I pay no mind. I said, oh, maybe it's just a tourist, you know. He said, forget about it. And then, uh, darn it, three months later, I received a, a, a mail here and with the airplane ticket, I said, huh? I said, boy, this is real. So, <laughs> however, I couldn't get the documentation done, so I missed the flight. So I wrote back to Bob, said, I missed the flight. He said, I'm going to cost you something now. I said, fine. But anyway, make sure sure. So I, and the following, the following years, I received a, another airplane ticket, and I, I'd be able to get my documentation done. And the IM came from January 18, 1972. It was cold winter. Uh, Bob came to Philadelphia Airport with his Russian hat on. Uh, <laughs> and here we go. So I, I stayed with Bob here in Milwaukee for 10 years. And then I went to, I went to a night school, I remember a night school at Dog High School. Uh, I had my high school and then went on to a nursing school for Wilmington. He said, he said to me before, he said to me, he said, you need some, some kind of a school that will give you jobs. A, a, a steady job, so went to nursing school, and then uh, I became a nurse, a registered nurse in 1977, and as I started working on the first week of January 1978, and since then I, I worked as a nurse until I retired. I, re I retired last year. Anyhow, the, in between that, if I if it wasn't Bob, I probably wouldn't be. I wouldn't be back home as. Uh, a farm, uh, my dad would be, be a farm, but it's the best. Uh, and then I also want to thank Bob that because I'm here, I met my lovely wife, we raised two sons, and they all uh, succeeded. 
Anyway, Bob, wherever you are, I just want to say thank you because of you and may you have so rest in peace. Thank you. I was not planning to speak today, but I uh, feel very moved for what has been said about war. I am going to tell you a little bit about my own story of how I met Bob. My name is Julio Juan. I came from Argentina. At the time I came here was uh, 1979. I uh, was attracted by a program that was at the United Campus Ministry, which is uh, was about South Africa, and I was. Uh, very aware, fully aware of what was going on there in terms of the apartheid. And I was interested in seeing what these Americans, the Gringos, had to say about uh, those issues, which I felt, well, probably nobody cares about that out here. So uh, I went there, the meeting or the event was organized by uh, the Reverend Andrews. And uh, there it was a speaker. Uh, I believe her name was Motla de Pula. She was a charismatic African woman who came in to speak about uh, the apartheid in South Africa. Uh, then uh, she, I, I understood that Bob and her were fighting against apartheid and, of course, were fighting for the freedom of. Nelson Mandela. Uh, one thing that uh, struck me there that at the time they were celebrating an early Christmas, and uh, the American way, I believe, at the time, everybody held hands and started singing these uh, traditional Christmas songs, and one of them was Silent Night. Uh, I don't know when the letter, but he would say, everything is in peace around or something like that. And to my uh, surprise, this woman, Monta de Pula, uh, after the thing, she said, shame on of you. There is no, there could not be any peace if there is no justice. And when I left the meeting that night, for me it was clear, I should have I should belong to the meeting right away, which I joined. And that was the beginning of my uh, belonging to the UCM, and of course, uh, my life, uh, throughout my life, I enriched my knowledge and my life itself by being at the UCM led by the Reverend Andrews, and uh, of course, by is my personal friendship with him. And uh, I really have a lot to thank to him for, for the so many good uh, times he spent, and the so much I learned from so many different uh, uh, guest speakers he brought, and his own you know, events where he would speak. It was really, for me, I was a person that I really admired. You know, one of the guest speakers, you know, very prominent people around the world, like the president of, of Costa Rica, Don Rodrigo Carazo, then the vice president of Guatemala, eh, Francisco Villagran Kramer, the Minister of Economics, eh, Mr. Sol from Guatemala, from eh, El Salvador, then at one time eh, the uh, <coughs> ambassador of Nicaragua, of the newly eh, the, 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 the government, the Sandinista government, uh, and you could mention so many people, including leaders of the liberation theology, that came in and enriched our knowledge of lives. And I really believe that we learn about everything, a lot of things that normally we could have learned anywhere. Uh, Unfortunately, the University of Edinburgh, like any university in the world, is uh, very limited, 
there are some exceptions, of course, with some other universities. It's very limited to teach only technical issues or issues that are not conflicting. And he was a person who was conflicted by, by what he, his ideas were. He could speak out without any fear, which I admire that. He could talk about any issue without concerns about how his position was going to be, and ultimately, I believe that it cost his position at the, uh, uh, at the university because of, of, of his, uh, his ideas. You know, he, uh, he, he made a lot of enemies and also he made a lot of friends. And all those friends that he made, who he shared the ideas, believe that there is no or cannot be peace in the world without, without justice. And I think that is the basic idea that all of us believe. You know? uh, and he fought for justice, speaking out without any fear to anyone, to anyone. He was a very honest and faithful one. And I believe that you know that has its merits. And uh, I I'm uh, really uh, deeply uh, 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 sorry for this loss. I feel that I lost a brother, a mentor, a friend, all of you. And really thank you for all of you to have come here. And I, I see that he has helped not only me, but all the community by creating awareness through so many information to the guest speakers and himself. And we have to thank him for all this. And I am here to honor his memory. And rest in peace, well, thank you. <laughs>
one day the phone rang, and it was from Costa Rica. And it was Bob saying, I hear you founded a group, this is great. And he then went on for 45, 50 minutes, <laughs> telling, giving me his opinion on all the various issues uh, having to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, I got one more call from him when something else was brewing, but uh, I knew that uh, he was an, certainly a, an honorary member of our group and with us in spirit. <clears throat> from what I know of Bob and what I've heard from some of the rest of you here tonight, I made a list of how we remember Bob Andrews. And let us count the ways alphabetically. <laughs> Acerbic, bullheaded, <laughs> courageous, daunting, ecumenical, funny, gracious, hellraiser, <laughs> intelligent, judgmental, kind, loving, magnetic, no nonsense, opinionated, passionate, quizzical, religious, or righteous, spiritual, tenacious, undaunted, <coughs> visionary, wise, and you have to cut me some slack on this one, excitable, <laughs> <laughs> youthful, and most of all, zero tolerance for injustice. These are some of the ways we remember Bob Andrews. And I suspect these are the way, ways that some remember the Old Testament prophets and certainly our Lord Jesus was remembered this, these ways by his contemporaries. Not bad company, eh? <laughs> fellowship out there, but I have a couple couple items on the program we need to uh, finish up. The first one is we are in church, and that means we have to sing, so everybody stand up.
the one. Wonderful voices. And now Bob is going to uh, deliver us a benediction before we pray for lunch. Let us stand. Oh, you are standing. <laughs> now let us go in peace. And may the God of peace and justice who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ make us complete in everything good so that we may do God's will, working among us that which is pleasing in God's sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And the Michael Salam, everyone. Go in peace. Thank <laughs> you.